You are overthinking private email. There is no such thing. Where are you right now? By default? Is that even a real YouTube channel? Yeah, you have gone completely too deep. Look, I understand, dude, I need to get off Gmail, and email is a core component of both my online and in-person identity, so I just need to pick the best thing. That makes sense. Get the best service with the best features. But if you're comparing Swiss versus German privacy laws as if any of that fundamentally matters, you have gone too far. If you have a personal Libra booted open BSD email server in an unregistered nuclear bunker with a crypto domain connected to Tor and blurred out on Google Maps, the other half of your email still went across some ISP network and is just sitting on someone else's email server. I'm not saying privacy isn't important and just give up. Get your email off Google servers. But you also can't worry about how ProtonMail would treat you as if you were a cartel leader or terrorist. Because if you are, you shouldn't be using an inherently insecure protocol like email. And also you should stop doing crimes. You can't trust any of these companies, no matter what level of zero trust encryption, open source clients, Swiss privacy laws they have. Any of these companies can technically, in a theoretical sense, serve your IP a malicious login page the next time you log in that just steals your credentials and 2FA so they get full access to your account. There are of course legal and corporate safeguards against wiretapping like this. I'm sure this would destroy any company that actually did it, but the fact is, if you see a little lock icon next to mycoolultraencryptedemail.com, you'll enter your credentials into any page they serve you. So at the very least, by choosing one of these services, you're trusting them and their employees not to hijack your account via a malicious page on their own domain. And obviously, all these services could just read your email as it's coming in before they encrypt it on their servers if they wanted to. I imagine many of you know this because this is your 11th video you're watching about encrypted email services, but your email provider receives your regular ass unencrypted emails. Then they perform whatever zero access hot Switzerland encryption before they write it to their database. Both Proton and Skiff have pages where they're upfront about this, but they're usually not shouting from the rooftops like, hey, we can read all your email. In particular, this Proton blog post is excellent. Someone using a Gmail account sends an email to a ProtonMail account. When it arrives at ProtonMail, our servers can read that email. This isn't some secret, this is just how unencrypted email works, but it's important for Proton to make sure their customer understands how it works. The Skiff white paper is pretty upfront about this too. You've got unencrypted mail going to the Skiff encryption service in a little box. It's like it's saying, hey, we get all your unencrypted stuff and then our encryption service encrypts it before we store it. Usually, if anything, providers will have like one little sentence about this, despite it relating to virtually all email they will ever process. Proton actually has another really bad encryption explained page that I don't like. It says, unless you use PGP, okay, Proton, cool, no one uses PGP. Just delete the second bullet point too, because no one uses PGP. The email message is encrypted in transit using TLS and stored on our servers using zero access encryption. It is not end-to-end -end encrypted, however, it might be accessible to the sender's email service. This kind of explanation does not help average users understand encryption. It's basically implying that only the far-end service could possibly see the email contents. Yeah, it's TLS encrypted in transit. Transit to where? To the ProtonMail server, where it is decrypted and then zero access encrypted before being stored. This one basic thing is so important because it's the primary reason that you have to trust your email provider. No matter if their code is open source, no matter if they've been audited in the past, you are trusting that the code running on their email servers at this instant is not copying your emails. And I almost got really mad at Proton for this kind of bullshit explanation until I found the blog post where they actually give by far the best explanation of any company. For a more typical example, here's Tutanota's crappy explanation. We never store unencrypted emails on our server. However, the non-encrypted emails are not protected with end-to-end -end encryption, but are only encrypted once they reach our servers. Like, yeah, I get the sense that unencrypted email is unsafe, but if I'm a normal person, I really only have a vague idea of what this literally means. I don't know, if I was running an email service for paranoid weirdos, I would want to make it extremely clear how a message is encrypted as it traverses each component and who gets to decrypt it. If you want the most transparent and most upfront email service, it's cock.ly. 
How can I trust you? You can't. It is 100% possible for me to read all your email. Any encryption implementation would still technically allow me to read email too. Then it tells you to use your own PGP encryption because why would you trust the code running on your email provider servers? To be clear, you definitely shouldn't use cock.ly, but I appreciate that they tell you honestly that they can't be trusted rather than throwing around words like encryption and open source. A lot of these services have detailed information about how end-to-end -end encrypted emails within their ecosystem works. Like I'm sure Proton to Proton, Skiff to Skiff, and Tutanota to Tutanota email messages are the most quantum resistant, nuclear bomb proof, Edward Snowden approved encrypted messages that you can send on the internet. But I've never investigated their security because of course it's entirely useless. If you have a Tutanota account, you will never send another email to another Tutanota account. And if you're like, aha, but me and my weird friend actually do have the same encrypted email provider and we're gonna send each other end-to-end -end encrypted sensitive information, even then, why are you trusting a cloud-hosted third-party webmail service to send ultra-secure messages rather than a purpose-built secure messenger that wouldn't even leave the encrypted messages on someone else's server? Like I understand the contents of the email message are encrypted and decrypted client side with end-to-end -end encryption, so it is impossible for the service provider to read the message, but they still have the metadata. In the case of Proton, they might still have the subject and send and receive email address. Like this is a nice benefit, don't get me wrong, but if you need to hide your communications with someone, depending on the service, it still only goes so far, no matter how many times they say end-to-end -end encryption. I understand hating the state of online privacy. I understand wanting the best, hottest, most modern, trustless, open source, whiz-bang encrypted email. But you can't pretend you're choosing your web-based email provider like your communications threat model includes the United States government. It's like doing 15 hours of research on the best waterproof open source t-shirt to keep you dry in a rainstorm. If you are an activist, political dissident, journalist, whistleblower, criminal, stop doing crime, persecuted minority, live under a repressive regime, or otherwise your life or freedom depend on private email, you need to stop using email. Like, I don't know, maybe check out Briar or Matrix. Apparently they're good enough that the Indian government tried to ban them. All right, for everyone else, we understand that all webmail is just a CIA honeypot. All of our emails are sitting on NSA and Australian intelligence servers and getting analyzed with quantum dark matter AI algorithms. And the primary evil that we're actually getting away from here is Google, right? Okay, so that being understood, should you use Skiff or Proton? Why isn't Tutanota in the running? Because I've never actually used Tutanota, but I've gone through the hassle of switching over my entire life, literally all of my accounts, both to paid Skiff and then paid Proton plans. So I do have a lot of experience with them. I'm not just basing this on claims from their websites. Also, should you just set up your own email server? Sounds really secure. I don't know, I've never done that and I never will do that. Not only does that sound like a security hassle, but I've had some minor issues with domains not sending to or receiving emails from Proton and Skiff. And I have to imagine that issue would be so much worse if your email is coming from gamersmokedog.com hosted on a Hetzner VPS. So I'm not running my own email server. All right, email, Proton wins. Yeah, that was fast. Why? Last year, Proton bought Simple Login, an email alias service similar to Apple's Hide My Email or Addy.io. I probably get more value out of this service than I get from Proton Mail itself. I try to limit how many accounts I create in general, but it sure feels better to give a random unique email to every single contact to limit my exposure in a data breach or my info being sold. If I'm ordering a pizza or something online and they need a single use email, it works as a disposable email address too, so I don't have to deal with all the places that block Gorilla Mail. I have encountered some websites that block simple logins free domains, but I haven't encountered a website that blocks their premium domains. Why is it important that Proton bought Simple Login? It means you're trusting one company with your email now. Sure, you can use a third-party alias service with Skiff, but then all of your emails are going through two companies. Because of course, your email alias provider also has access to all of your emails, if they wanted it. To be clear, don't trust these companies anyway, but trusting one over two decreases your exposure. So a lot of these email services give you a bunch of aliases, maybe like 20. And I used to manage that and it's no good. I'd have one for personal emails, one for banking, one for spam, one for OnlyFans subscriptions. 
but that doesn't really solve the problem of having to give out a quote unquote real email address. If one of your email addresses appears in a data breach or starts getting spam, you can't really just delete it. Unlimited aliases is amazing because you don't really have to have a real email address anymore. As far as webmail and apps, both are basically imitating Gmail and it's fine. Both are definitely way slower and less responsive than Gmail, I assume because they're decrypting things on the client end as you click around. Skiff used to have problems rendering a small amount of my emails. For example, I had a bank transaction email where the amount would render vertically one character at a time. They are improving though. If you go back to those same emails, they look fine. I will say ProtonMail renders emails slightly better. Let's bring up an email I think everybody gets daily, an eBay saved search for 1939 World's Fair coins. Proton's font and rendering looks a little bit better, probably more accurate to what the message should look like, but it's not a big deal. Neither iPad app supports a split view, which would be my preferred way of reading email, but the webmails do. Proton has a couple more customizations, like letting you define swipe actions or quick toolbar actions, like you can add a save to PDF button to your toolbar. Okay, if this is a reason to choose one over the other, I cannot help you. Proton apps are better for small reasons like this, but usually not super consequentially. A couple services I used had an issue sending account confirmation emails to the Skiff domain. GitHub and Logseek were two of them earlier this year. Hopefully this improves as Skiff becomes more popular. But with simple login, I also had one issue that Groupon wouldn't send me a confirmation email. Yeah, I know, I bought a Groupon. I'm poor, I'm uncool, judge me. One last thing, Proton has a password protected emails feature, which is really easy to use. You just press the lock icon and set a password on the email. This lets you send an end-to-end -end encrypted message to anyone, including attachments, and it lets them respond. This works because it's not really an email, they're just getting a link to a password protected page on Proton.com. It's very similar to Bitwarden Send, which is something I imagine about half of you have built into your browser right now but it's still a nice way to send an encrypted message to a normie if they're like asking for your Hulu password. For the calendars, I used to use a Google Calendar shared with various family members, which was incredibly convenient. And you will be giving up all that convenience when you use either Skiff or Proton because they're encrypted services for weirdos. Skiff is like shared calendars. Yeah, with Skiff accounts, I don't know a single other person on the planet with a Skiff account, let alone my mom. Both of these calendars do everything you need them to do. The most important thing I need is repeating events with custom timeframes, which both of them do fine. I also want email reminders to remind me when bills are due and things like that, which I believe only Proton has. Skiff does have mobile notifications, but I'm not a big phone user, so I need email. Also an important difference, Proton lets you subscribe to external calendars, such as your wife's Google Calendar, but Skiff currently doesn't. Speaking of giving up convenience, if you're switching from Google Drive to one of these, you're gonna realize pretty quickly how user-friendly Google Drive is. You need to preview a .wav file or even edit a text file on Proton? Nope. Until very recently, Proton Drive was strictly web-based storage meaning you drag and drop stuff into the browser and then download it later. There are some limited file previews, but that's it. Recently, they did add a Windows app, which lets it sync folders automatically like Dropbox, which makes it, you know, an actual useful product for some people. I have faith that the drive experience might be better one day, but Proton is a slow moving company and cloud storage providers don't actually want you to use all the storage you pay for. So I'm not really surprised it's mediocre. I personally use it as an archival backup location, meaning I just manually dump some backup files onto it sometimes. Skiff Drive is a mess. It has almost the exact opposite problem in Proton in that it wants to be an editor for all your files, so it has the same exact interface as their notes app. Your notes are all just files, so you'll just see all your notes in the root directory of your drive. Like, I get the fact that notes are technically files, but I'm gonna use the Pages app if I need to see my notes. I'm using the Drive app to see my other files. So to keep things organized, I create a separate folder for both my files and my notes. I just It's really weird that the notes and the files apps, they feel like the exact same thing. I don't really understand the difference. When looking at your files, I think you only get this list view, so you're not gonna be able to see things like image thumbnails. This .json file is a song I made. It's 20,000 lines of text, but if I click it, it, it freezes the interface for like 10 seconds. And even then, when it does preview it, it is unusably slow. And even though this text is here, I can't actually edit it. 
I have the option to convert it to a page which duplicates the file in this folder and makes it a skiff plain text note. That is literally never something I would actually want to do if I wanted to edit a file, but I guess the option is there. Finally, I hit a bug that permanently ate storage space on my account. I believe it had to do with interrupted file transfers. The space of a partial transfer was just permanently gone. And this has since been fixed, but that was kind of the last little issue that made me initially check out Proton. I was hitting a few small things like no GitHub confirmation email, incorrectly formatted bank emails, drive acting weird and having a bad interface. And I just thought, I don't want to be chasing down small bugs. This is probably the most important service I use, not some free project. I just want to use the most stable thing. I'm sure some bleeding heart software developer is out there like, Skiff is the little guy, cut them some slack, they don't have 150 developers like Proton. But you know what, I'm just like a normal guy, paying user, I'm not part of your company. I just want the best thing. The old issues were fixed, but just as another small example, I tried to recreate the storage bug for this video, but I found something else. I'm gonna upload this .wav file to my drive and close the tab partway through my transfer. Now if I reopen the drive, it looks like this file is here. It has the full file size. I would think this transfer is successful, but this file is nothing. I can't download this because the transfer never completed. Is this a big deal? No, who cares? But in 2023, when my other options are generally as polished and unjanky as ever, little things like this make Skiff feel a little more, let's say, homegrown. As far as notes, Pages is Skiff's killer feature, and Proton has zero analog. Notes is the thing that originally drew me to Skiff. I don't like online notes because I don't trust any online service, and I don't like free services because I like to know that my account is sustainable. So if I had to use online notes, I might potentially use Skiff's $3 plan just for notes. And hey, I'd get a nice email to go along with it. That seems like a pretty good deal. Skiff is comparable to or cheaper than other simple online encrypted note services like Crypty, Standard Notes, or Cryptpad. And I got you, I got you, this is another notes video. I told you, I only make notes videos. This is a productivity channel, yeah. The interface, it's similar to Notion. Let me just tell you, this is not Notion by any stretch of the imagination, but you could set up hierarchical notes with headings, tables, images, equations, code blocks, and cute icons for all your crap. It's not exceptionally beautiful. It's not full of exceptional features like Notion's databases, but we live in a capitalist hellscape where online notes platforms are straight up spyware or kind of expensive. And it feels like Skiff is kind of filling a real price niche here. For people who aren't going to go full offline self-hosted because it's a hassle, but you don't want to give all of your data to Notion or Dropbox, I think this could be a good service. I understand, VPNs are a controversial field on their own, and maybe, depending on your use case, a VPN directly linked to your email provider, which is the closest thing to an online identity, doesn't feel like perhaps the most private thing, but ProtonVPN is obviously a big value add on a Proton subscription. I fully understand that using a VPN is not a magic privacy tool, it's just giving all of your internet traffic to the VPN provider instead of your ISP. But my carriers are the enemy. My ISP is fucking Google, and every mobile provider collects and sells your web traffic. So yeah, given the choice between an ISP definitely maliciously collecting my data and Proton theoretically having the ability to do so, I'm gonna go with the VPN. Besides, VPNs shield my real IP from the web services themselves. I don't want my IP in the logs of, I don't know, cutepuppies.net. Like, I know, VPNs oversell themselves with all kinds of security bullshit to trick normies, but the specifically anti-VPN people really need to explain to me how giving all of my internet data to Verizon or Google or Comcast is preferable to giving it to Mulvad or Proton. Anyway, regardless if you're suspicious of your ISP, geo-hopping for better deals, or downloading torrents of Linux ISOs, it's simply a good service. All right, Proton, what's going on? You have my email and my contacts and my internet history, and now you want all my passwords? Literally everyone I know uses Bitwarden or KeePassXC, which are already free, so I don't see this as having much value. I think every Proton customer would rather have them put development resources into a notes app or improving their other products like Drive. But remember when everyone switched from LastPass to Bitwarden? 
You guys just wait for Bitwarden to screw it all up. Then all of a sudden, everyone's going to be on Proton Pass. I guess notably, this does have integrated 2FA, which is a premium Bitwarden feature, so maybe that sways someone. There are reasons to not like Proton. They sold out that French activist. They don't have zero access encryption of contacts or email subjects, as far as I understand their encryption, which seems like... I don't know, things that I would want to keep private if I'm at all concerned about email privacy? And of course, they're a CIA honeypot. For legal reasons, that's a joke. But from a value and usability perspective, it just gets W after W over Skiff. Does Gen Z say W like that to mean win? I'm trying to sound younger than I am. Skiff is good. I think ProtonMail is a little better in most ways. If one of these two services speaks to you over the other, like you want the encrypted notes with Skiff, just use it. The important thing is getting off an openly surveilling platform like Gmail or Outlook and onto a platform that makes money with your money, not with your data. There is no perfect privacy email provider because we are talking about email. It is just 300% not a thing. You are looking for something that does not exist. One real thing I think Skiff has going for it is that most people could probably get by on the $36 a year plan. Or even just the overly generous free plan. I just don't trust any free plans with important data. Proton is $120 a year. You get a lot more for that $120 a year, but dollars are dollars and there's a good chance you aren't paying for email at all right now. You could just get Proton Mail for $48 without the other services, but that doesn't even get you unlimited simple login aliases, so it's kind of lame. The thing is, I don't know if most people watching a video like this care about value or usability or the fact that email sucks in general. It's just boring old normal Bob working 9 to 5, maybe watches some weird videos online, but probably also watches tech lore. He mostly just gets Bed Bath & Beyond coupons in his email, but in the back of his mind, he's like, But just in case the FBI or the Swiss government subpoenas my email, what unencrypted information are they able to provide? And I think Skiff can provide less, and that's all that matters to some people. But they're also based in the United States, and that's all that matters to other people. Proton encrypts fewer things with zero-knowledge encryption than Tutanota or Skiff. For example, email subject lines, far-end addresses, and attachment names are big ones. And yeah, I still really don't understand it. But the German government forcing Tutanota to spy on incoming and outgoing emails of suspected criminal accounts makes the encryption at rest argument pretty moot. It proves that even a provider with almost no access to data at rest is still a threat to its users. And whenever Tutanota responds to this, they say, well, hey, we have all your emails over here, but we can't get to them because they're perfectly end-to-end -end encrypted. We can't touch that. And if you use the end-to-end -end encrypted email feature, you're still totally safe, which would be fantastic if you never sent or received emails ever again, or if you used the end-to-end -end encrypted Tutanota emails that you definitely never use. This isn't Tutanota's fault, to be clear. They fought and lost in court. Proton has done the same. Skiff definitely will do that in the future. These are companies that have to comply with warrants no matter how unjust you think it is. Proton potentially has the most resources available for legal battles, the most money at risk with their reputation, and the most favorable jurisdiction. But none of these companies can protect your communication from the government, and we live in a world where you don't actually use end-to-end -end encrypted emails. Just remember, if you're sweating the specifics of at-rest encryption, such as Proton not encrypting subject lines, at the end of the day, it's just email. Any of these companies can pwn you at any time if they wanted to or if they had to. So in my opinion, as a person who uses email for things like getting my 1939 World's Fair memorabilia saved searches, and probably, probably is never gonna end up on Europol's shit list, just use the service that has the best features. For me, simple login is the killer feature. For you, it might be skiff notes and more comprehensive end-to-end -end encryption for data at rest. And for someone who values everything being end-to-end -end encrypted at rest and doesn't trust America, which, yeah, fair, Tutanota might be the best option. Just get off Gmail. They are all good options. And they're all bad options. Because it's just email. And email is not private.